What's up, guys? Welcome back. This is Gate 7 International. I'm your host, Adi. I'm joined by my fellow colleague, Costas Llanos. Costa, how are you doing, buddy? All the best for being with you, my friend. All the best for being with you. Yep. And uh, we're going to get into commiserate, a little get into the misery together, I guess, as it is the, the outlook of what's been going on. It's been a very interesting day. So... We have a lot to talk about, especially in regards to a certain piece of news, and we're going to get to that. But before we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe, everyone, if you're here. If you don't follow us already, think about giving us that subscribe click. It costs you nothing, and it really helps us continue to find more and more red and white fans in the community. Follow us on social media as well. There's a lot of great content that comes out, great analysis. And lastly, don't forget Patreon. You can support us on Patreon. You can join our WhatsApp group. For only a dollar a month, you get access to some information that we don't always share live. We don't share it always on social media. And, of course, we make fun of each other using AI. So it's really fun, dollar a month. And uh, there's other tiers as well. If you want extra content, you get up to t- up to two extra episodes a month if you're in the next content tier. Uh, plus, a lot of goodies are coming. Uh, you saw the teaser for the Gate 7 International online store. That is going to be coming soon. Uh, Our go-live date is December 20th, as it stands. So cross your fingers. Hopefully nothing pops up that delays it, but we're really excited. And that's just the start of what will be a really huge project because there's a lot of stuff down the road uh, that will be joining that store. So thank you guys for your support. We have a lot of fun stuff coming. And without further ado, it's time to get to the nitty-gritty. It's time to get to what everybody is here to talk about because there was huge news this morning. Fabrizio Romano tweeted that Pedro Alves from Estoril in uh, Portugal is going to be taking over the sporting director role from Antonio Cordon. Now, the insiders uh, had their own articles that came out. Both Nicola Coppolo said things and then both Nico Scozzi said things as well about the context around this Gordon is still involved he's not he hasn't been let go but Gordon is going to be overseeing things for Nottingham Forest as we already know he was consulting in that manner uh, for mm-hmm. Nottingham Forest for Olympia Ross Coast Wilson and, does the job he does for Olympia Coast. correct and for uh, Rio Ave as well so he's going to be um, coordinating I think was the exact uh translation you would use for the Greek that was used for that. Um, and he's going to be involved on a macro scale and like coordinating. A, coordinating. coordinating. <laughs> okay, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so he is going to be kind of like managing things, that strategy, the transfer strategy for all three clubs, while Pedro Alves will be the Olympiacos focused sporting director now. So This has left a lot, a lot of people very unhappy across social media, a lot. And it's not just you guys Uh, in our own in our own chat with us, with our patrons. You know, we have our concerns as well. And there's a lot to talk about here. And I think the before Costa, before we get into our opinions, I think we should discuss and facts. Yes. We before we get into that, I think we should discuss most likely what is trying to be obtained here. And then we can follow up with our opinions and our facts on this. And for me, regardless of what my opinion is, which I'll get into later, from the outset, it is looking like Marinakis, while he's building this football empire, uh, which may or may not include Monza. We know he was linked with a purchase of Monza in the past. Nothing came from it, but... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if something materializes maybe this summer as well. Yeah, I don't think it's over. I don't think that uh, a potential yeah, for I think is over I, just yet. Exactly. I think that we could see him making a move there in the end as well. But there is a very clear network of clubs being created here under this empire. Uh, similar to what we've known, at, what has been called, and books have been written about it, what's called the Red Bull philosophy. Red Bull was really the first organization to do this multi-club model, which is now being replicated by a lot of owners. City football group, for example. Correct. Yeah. So uh, he's creating his own football group, trying to emulate 
what is going on at Red Bull. Now, what that means and what it has meant for other groups that have tried to do the same thing is that there is a clear strategy. There's each individual club is individually run and governed by themselves. However, they all fall under the same strategy, what we would say is a macro strategy or something that governs all of them. It's the same goal that they're all supposed to be in alignment of. At Red Bull, it is everything works in a way as a feeder system with the primary goal to be to push the, the top club, which is Leipzig, RB Leipzig. The talent all ends up going there. Deals get structured, of course, between each club. Money flows to each club. But in the end, they all are meant to feed RB Leipzig. I wonder who the top club is going to be in this group. Well, so that's that's where we're getting there. I wonder. Uh, the, the same is happening with Citigroup and its associated clubs. Mm -hmm. And you have to wonder if that is the strategy that's being emulated here, which it's the one that works. It's the one every, it's the playbook everybody is running. Gordon is going to be the, what is called, Red Bull calls them the global board, which is, it is a, a, a financier, a, trans, a, a director, a sporting director, uh, various positions that govern what the global direction of the, the conglomerate will say, the, the group of football associations within them is going to do, what the strategy is. So if that is the case, and this is the plan that's going to be in place, it would be logical for us to assume that in this case, Nottingham Forest would be the Leipzig of the model, the destination in the Premier League that everyone is meant to go. Then that leaves, what is the goal of Rio Ave? Clearly, in Portugal, a developing a developed association, uh, a group that is um, easier to bring in talent from Brazil, especially uh, talent maybe from South America, and it's easier to bring players through there. The then question becomes, if that is the, the role of Rio Ave, which it would make sense, given that it's Portugal and how the culture of development is there, where does Olympiacos stand in this Red Bull model, in this network model? And this is where our opinions and our issues and the issues of the fan base come in. Costa, you go ahead and share your, your opinions. Um, the, we, we have a lot, so go ahead. Do you see the, the philosophy here? Or do you do you see it and you just don't believe it's going to work how it's expected? What what is your give me everything? Tell me what you're thinking about all this. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I was thinking more of something like City Football Group is what uh, Marinakis Magelis Marinakis is trying to do here. And the thing is that Marinakis is um, the thing. The thing is that uh, contrary to uh, to City Football Group and uh, Sheik uh, Mansour, for example. He's surrounded by very capable people like Tsiki Bagiristain, like uh, Haldun Al Mubarak, like Pep Guardiola as well. Uh, we don't exactly have that right now at Marinakis Group. Let's call them Marinakis Group just you know to make people understand what it is we're trying to say. Um, you mentioned the word the word philosophy. I don't really understand what the philosophy now is. When Antonio Cordon joined Olympiacos as the new sporting director, he was uh, met with cheers and a lot of expectation and a lot of positivity that like or, or Olympiacos are finally turning a page. They want to put last season shambles uh, to the past. Uh, and then six months later, well, before we get to six months later, we saw some moves during the summer that made us think, hmm, was that Cordon's pick? Did Cordon really ask Marinakis for Nottingham Forest rejects? Was he the one who said, Hey, 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 Chief, I really need some players from Nottingham Forest. I really like that Gustavo Scarpa and Julian Biancon. Was Daniel Podens really Cordon's choice? Was Sotiris Alexandropoulos? And then six months after his arrival, we hear he's, well, he's not going to be the football director of Olympiacos, at least exclusively. He's going to be somewhat of a global a global overlord, global president kind of thing overlooking overlooking us all. 
We also heard from Cotsis. I read from Cotsis that uh, Cordon has been dealing with family problems. Unfortunately, that's true. And when I say unfortunately, I don't mean like, you know, oh, man, I wish they were just I wish they were lying to us and we could do a gotcha journalism. It's unfortunate because he has family problems. It's we don't want anyone to have family problems. That is true. But then I personally think to myself that the way the Greeks presented it was Cordon couldn't really handle couldn't really handle a lot of workload right now at Olympiacos, but then you're telling me that the same person who cannot handle workload at Olympiacos now now is going to have to handle even more workload across Nottingham Forest, Rio Ave, and Olympiacos. That doesn't really that doesn't really make a lot of sense for me. And what really disappoints me right now is that this thing happens mid-season when Olympiacos are not exactly where they want to be. It's great for Olympiacos that Panathinaikos lost to Aris, a rare loss. Uh, for Panathinaikos, and that's not, that means Olympiacos are one point behind Panathinaikos, pending what happens at Kass, but I wouldn't hold my breath about what's going to happen to Kass. We're going to know in four months, about four months, or about March or April, because the paperwork has been handed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. But Olympiacos are not in a great position right now. we got a very big game against Freiburg, which we're going to tackle later, but if Olympiacos don't win against Freiburg, Europa League is over, officially. So when it comes to the league, Olympiacos are not really convincing that they are going to be the ones who are going to finish first uh, come May. Uh, Olympiacos are not convincing that they're going to be in the Europa League uh, after New Year's. And then to pull off something like this, saying that, hey, you know, remember that guy I brought in to change everything and uh, take us to the next level? Yeah, he's not exactly going to be working for us anymore because uh, he's going to be overlooking uh, some other two teams I got. Well... Ari, I'm just going to finish like this, and I'm just going to say I'm disappointed. Personally, I'm disappointed. I want to ask the, I want to ask you, and I want to ask the comment section if they're also disappointed. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm a little, uh, maybe I'm a little um, being a little negative. Well, Costa, look, it's the fact that uh, we did get it verified that there is something, uh, you know, uh, an issue that's causing this, a family problem. That's mm. uh, that's kind of created this there, there's good and bad right because we if if he had been cut or fired right we would know that okay people aren't happy with what's going on something's happening in the background if he had left the position just up and left for no reason maybe he doesn't want to deal with it anymore or you know there were things aren't going his way like the 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 circumstance regarding this is it's at least okay there's a family matter there's something else uh but i i also am with you in regards to like the circumstance like okay he's he doesn't have enough time to deal with 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 this and be here he's flying back to spain all the time but um he's able to handle all three all three clubs in that in that fence to me that sounds like it's it's more um it more it's more work but anyway that that's besides the point my there's a there's just a couple of things here for me uh as far as it and and but once i get these comments out there's a lot of comments from our audience so we'll touch on some of those but uh i have a couple of issues with this my my first one is if if again this is if we are trying to mimic or emulate this this model from red bull that's fine and normally, I probably, I wouldn't be as upset if I know where Lubiaco stands. If we know, if if the club communicated concretely, which it doesn't usually do, hey, the Nottingham Forest is here, Olympiacos is here, Rio Ave is here. If we had that clarity, I I'd, I'd feel a little bit better. I know most of the fan base wouldn't because they want win, they want Olympiacos to be the priority. They would want to win. But in the end, if I knew there was a comprehensive strategy, I knew we were going to continue to be dominant here in Greece. I could accept that. But another the, another problem I have is what makes the Red Bull system work is a system of development, concerted development, development of players, talent identification, and, and a real plan with which to how things are maneuvered. Right, how players go, which way, which place, and where. So we will have to see how that pans out. But if we're basing a, an a, 
an opinion on this outlook from historical perspective, how we look at how Libyakos has done things. And that's just not matching up with at all what how we've done things. I mean, Libyakos has not been the best when it comes to to talent development and retention and that and that that whole series of things. I mean, we've seen very big strides just in the last year in the academy. Very good. We have some great prospects coming out like Costulas, uh, Muzakitis, uh, some players that look promising in such a young age. Are you 19s? For the first time, somebody's been able to unseat Balk in the U19, which is huge. But then look at what's happened with the B team. The B team, the the project that was supposed to be the B team hasn't really borne the fruits or or been the the mechanic in the the system of development that we expected it to be. And it's I, I don't know. It's I, I for the reasons for the success of the Red Bull model, I don't see us adopting the things properly that will make the model successful or that should make the model successful. Now, there's a lot of caveats here, right? Uh, because the inclusion of Rio Ave introduces a new dynamic. And a lot of what's being discussed is based on what's been happening between Libyakos and Nottingham Forest. So, so far, the relationship between Nottingham Forest and Libyakos is, it, it, it hasn't worked. Players that have come from Nottingham Forest have not done well here. And vice versa, when we sent players to Nottingham Forest, they didn't do well either. So like that that relationship has not translated well. So maybe the real Ave part of it will have will have something different to it. Maybe, maybe that's a little bit of that extra sauce that can write write the network in that way. Because maybe, maybe, maybe the players that were being sent to Forest for Greece, you know, maybe. Maybe something's lost in translation there. They don't want to perform here. They don't want to be here or whatever. Maybe the players that are coming from Rio Ave, if they're coming here, maybe they're more likely to be to do to be more motivated. They're more likely to see they're more likely to see it as a step in their career. It's uh, so so maybe we get more out of those players. But you know, we have had players come from Portugal, and it's been a mixed bag with the ones that we've gotten from there as well. So it's. Uh, I have mixed feelings. I will say this, though, and I've said this to a lot of people already online. Um, we really won't know how the interactions between the clubs in this triangle will be until the summer. Because in the next transfer window is when Mighty Nikes will officially have his 80% stake and the pieces will begin to move around and we'll begin to see how business is done. Now, remember, the board's approval of the buyout specified that the assets of Rio Ave get to stay there. So it's, we're not just going to be able to pull whoever we want from Rio Ave. There's going to be deal structured. We're going to see a lot of things there. Now, Cordon is different than a lot of directors, sporting directors or agents or chief scouts or whoever we've had in different roles of the same thing in the past. Can he, can he be the one that's the glue that holds this together? We'll have to see. We will really know this summer. We will get a pretty good idea, I think, even though it's just the first window. This coming summer, I think we will have a really good idea of how this will work out. And in a way, how Olympiacos will be involved and, and be positioned in that. But for now, we don't really know what Olympiacos his role is it going to be? Are we just going to be here where stuff from Rio Ave comes and rejects from Nottingham Forest continue to come? Are we going to be a part of the development model? I don't know. We'll see. We'll, we're going to have to wait and see how that goes. For me, this club does not have a good history of the development part. So I am unsure of where that is going to land us. Where's the part that we tend to do pretty well with? We are very good when it comes to second chances of players that maybe didn't make it in a top league like like the Premier League. Hasn't panned out much with the Forest guys, but players from the Premier League have come here and done very well. Look at Podence, Podence part 2, Joel Campbell, uh that you know, ex Arsenal player. I mean, these are, uh, uh thank you. you. You took that one right out of my mouth as well. Uh so what we there's a wait and see we have to do here. But if we are looking at the pattern of behavior of Olympiacos right now, I am a little bit negative on this uh, maybe not negative i'm suspect is what i'll say i don't believe 
that we will see something that's going to be hugely beneficial to Olympiacos in the end. I don't know. The one thing I will say, though, and the one thing that still gives me a glass half full mentality with this is, and people have asked me, um, the same people that think that Marinaki doesn't care about Olympiacos anymore. Marinaki is a diehard Olympiacos fan. Olympiacos is his, this is where he grew up. This is the team that he loves and he's always loved. And we have to say it, I don't mean this in a bad way, but the ego, the pride that he has, he wants to win to beat the other billionaires in Greece. Let's just put it that way. He wants to win. So for that, as long as that sentiment remains there, he will always have a concerted interest and passion and will for Libyakos to be dominant in Greece and just be a dominant club in general. Where I will begin to worry more and begin to really worry is if that goes away. If that sentiment goes away, then I will begin to worry. Well, it's kind of hard to know if that sentiment actually uh, goes from uh, from Vigelis Marinak. He's not going to come out and say, hey, guys, remember when I used to really care about Olympia? Because no, I don't really care. But the thing is, you are absolutely right. Mar Marinak grew up as, an, uh, as a major Olympia Coast fan. His father, Miltiadis, was part of the hierarchy as well. His son, Miltos, also loves uh, Olympiacos. I've met um, I've met Vagelis Marinakis, a really nice person, uh, treated me with a lot of respect. Uh, I could tell that this is a man who wants to do great things at Olympiacos. He still has the bar extremely high, uh, wants to see Olympiacos, not not as a Greek team. That, 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 if we have one thing in common between, if me and Marinakis have one thing in common based on our meeting is that we both want to see Olympiacos as a European team, not as a, uh, a Greek team. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the youth system, and I couldn't agree more with you. I had a bit of a of a debate with Martial de Beau, uh earlier today uh, about uh, Anigo and what he did with the youth. And for me, well, yeah, you mentioned it. Like it's important that the Pauk have been dethroned as the top team in the under 19s. But ever since the B team was created, the best addition Olympiacos have had from the B team is Andreas Doi, and that speaks volumes right there. Nothing came out of Surlis, nothing came out of Sabuzis, nothing came out of Kalogeropoulos. Bagalianis is 22 years old and still with the B team, and I'm just thinking, like, why, do, why are Olympiacos still paying him? Why aren't they just chucking him away if he's not good enough for the first team uh, at this age? And I'm going to be honest, like, if I were Musakitis and the Kostulas brothers, I think it'd be a good idea if they kind of you know, thought to themselves, hey, you know, is there maybe a plan B on this thing? Because the record hasn't been great so far. They're still 16. With Babis Kostulas, who is seen as the next big thing at Olympia, because he's only 16. I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe he has what it takes to start at Olympia, because first team right now. But the record hasn't been great. And uh, I do want to hope that Kostas Zolaikis will succeed Alexandros Paschalak is between the sticks. I, even if David Tejia, even if Keylor Navas come in, I will be very disappointed that Kostas Zolak is not the guy who gets the number one, uh, the number one spot. From then on, uh, you said a lot will be determined this summer, but here's the thing, like Olympiacos, one, two, they, they can't afford another trial season. This is Olympiacos' trial season. They can't just wait until the summer for all the pieces to fall together. This is the season in which uh, pieces needed to fall together, at least most of them. Olympiacos cannot go back to the whole trial in there next season. Next season needs to be better than this season again. Like I said, it's a, it's really unfortunate that this happens mid-season. I, 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 I can't really understand why this couldn't wait until June. This couldn't wait until May or something like that. I am very baffled. I When Cordon joined Olympiacos, I saw a vision. I saw that something is being done right there we knew a lot about cordon his philosophy how he wants to bring um talented players uh talented unknown players and then do the whole money ball thing on selling them th three times their price we didn't see much of that in the summer transfer window i mean i would like to go through all the signings with you Ari, and see if we can agree on which signings are most likely cordon signings if we may ortega we agree that was cordon Eze, Cordon. Yeah. Uh, I think Jovetic was Cordon, because Cordon brought him to Monaco. Maybe a, maybe an iffy on this one. I think it probably was. Ibor Akini, definitely Cordon. From Kini. then on, 
yeah, Kini and the, those five were definitely Cordon signings. Yeah. Re Maybe look, Bruce really the question, the question, I I know what you're getting at. The question is the Forest guys. Were those? No, no, not just those them. Cordon? Not just them. El Cabi, for example, and Brinich. Do you think those were Cordon signings? I do. Brinich especially, yes. Seven. Okay. Not bad. I, so so far we got seven. And then we're going Sol Bakken, uh, Biancon, Gustavo Scarpa, Holsgrove, Omar Richards, Jackson Porozo, Alexandropoulos, Freire. And I think that's it. It's those eight. So it's seven versus eight. I mean, lots of signings. You couldn't expect them all being yeah. Cordon signings. I, I but quite. Look, Brinich, Brinich, El Cabi, and Porozo, I would believe, th those feel like scouted finds to me. Um, uh, the, the ones where it's like, okay, maybe there's relationships involved. Alexandropoulos. Um, um, uh, let's see. who. Uh, oh, my God. Like the forest ones. Yeah. But here, here's the thing. I, w I could believe, right? Because uh, uh, there's always a lot of there's there's always a lot of conspiracy thinking with how a lot of things goes, and with respect to how a lot of business is done, I believe that Occam's razor tends to be correct with this. Usually, the simplest explanation is the one that's the correct one. And and with the case of quite a few of these, we were coming down to the wire, like Solbakin, right? So Ola Solbakin, we were coming down to the wire. We lost Despadov to Bach. We bring in, we got Podense as well, which was a, which was a, another thing. And that's Rafa Mir. And uh, yes. wanted to bring Rafa Mir. That's why we got the Jove, Jove right. The and remember, who is the 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 current CEO? So uh, sorry, not I guess she is CEO, CEO, CEO slash general director of Roma. Yeah, Lino Suluku is. So Lino Suluku. when. When you're when you're up against the wall, you go where you have the relationships, and that is a normal thing in this business, in any business. You go up against the wall, you go with who you have relationships with to see if you can get something done. Ola Solbakin was a player that made it very clear to Mourinho he wasn't comfortable with just being a bench option there. He wanted to play more. This was an option for him to try and get more playing time. He hasn't taken his chances, but you know it is what it is. But that makes sense to me. The forest things. It, it, we knew the budget was really tight this year. We spent money on certain areas. We thought we could get by on others. The center back issue, I think we were proven, you know, that maybe should have been an area we allocated real resources to, but we didn't. We trusted some loans and we've got what we've got so far. We hoped that we could get Biancone back faster. We didn't. We just saw him today for the first time or not yesterday. Sorry, not yesterday. Today. Yesterday wasn't great. I'm not going to lie, but it is he what can't it is. Play in Europe anyway. Yes. So and now we uh, have two center backs left. That's all well, for Europe. Man, that's, that's a that's a different uh, you know. We'll, we'll get into that conversation. But my no, my but whole it point is, is it is very important because oh, no, no, go ahead. My my whole point was he, we know that he has a consulting role at Forest. He knew he you know he knows he has those players that he can look at, and I believe that sure maybe they weren't his first choice or scouting wise. They weren't the ones that maybe he wanted. But in a pinch, he, he threw the dice and he said, look, I have to do something. And he knew he could get those in. Omar Richards, Biancon, he knew Scarpa. He knew he could get them. And that was it. So that's that's how it is. And I, I honestly also believe Jovetic was a last minute thing because we couldn't get anybody else we wanted either. So yeah. it's it's just one it's one of those things. It's just the the simplest thing makes so much sense to me. We And we know we had lists that he couldn't get. Like, look. Costa, you brought up in one of the exclusives that you did over the summer about the markets that Cordon was really big into. You even talked about it on the show. Spain, Argentina, right? Plus, and then areas where he knows there will Russia, be Russia, Ukraine, right? and Russia, Latin Ukraine. America in general, yeah. Right. But Spain, we couldn't really get anything. Kini and Ibora. We couldn't get any of his choices that were coming out of the Spanish market. He looked in Argentina, where he's very familiar with, and then he looked elsewhere. We could get stuff. So we, I mean, there maybe maybe we're missing something here, Costa, and maybe the, and this also can relate to the the this network and where Olympiacos fits in this empire. I think that we forget that the for players for a lot of players, ones that we're looking at that are not Greek, Olympiacos is not the proposition for their careers that it used to be. 
Do we offer Champions League they don't anymore? Play in the Champions League. Yeah, that's that's the right. thing. You know, no, we haven't been no in the Champions, Champions League, League perspective. Pers- prospect, there, there's sorry. there's no Champions League to offer players, and some players don't want to want to come. The ones that we talked to in the summer, unless they know we're making it in the Champions League, you know. So, th- what we are offering to players, really, and maybe this was something that would offered to that's offered to Jesse and Ortega. Maybe this is something that's kind of dangled as a way to get them to Olympiacos is that if they play well here, they can get a chance at Forest in the top flight in the Premier League. Is this, maybe, let's take this step back, and then we will get to your comments, guys. I know I said I would like 20 minutes ago, but maybe this is something that we have to take account of, and that we don't have Champions League to offer people anymore, at least consistently, until we start getting into that point again. So... If we don't, we have to. There's other vehicles that we're using to do that. We saw a little bit with the, with the Scarpa deal. I think that was supposed to be an Olympiacos signing, but he, when the deal was done, did not want to leave Forest. Um, ended up back here anyway. That's a different story altogether. But there is a new reality, and the new reality here is that we are not, or haven't been for a few years, a Champions League team. We get back into the Champions League, we'll see more do- doors open up for us in that regard. And that's there's so many there, there's so many pieces of this that 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 make what could happen in this network so hazy and and so crazy until we actually see what happens. But this is the reality. And you know, for, for people like me, to me, that just says, okay, well, maybe we focus less on these big money transfers and we develop our own talent. But I don't see how that, that that's just not in our DNA currently. I don't see how that's going to come out. But what uh, how, what do you think of that, Costa? Is there is there like a certain reality check we're missing with where Olympiacos sits in the football hierarchy? Forget Greece, but outside of Greece, is there something that maybe – as fans, we are not, we have not accepted yet. No, yeah, regard. absolutely. I think you hit the nail in the head. The Olympiacos are proving not to be in a champion, a Champions League side, as they've uh, they've missed out on how many years has that been? Two years, two years. Olympiacos, I mean, three years. That's the third year Olympiacos have missed out on the Champions League. Uh, and uh, soon enough, we're going to find out if they're a Europa League team as well. Uh, <laughs> I feel, I feel like that Freiburg game is a lot more important than just, you know, making it through to the last 32 or the or the last 16. It's not going to be the last 16. It's the last 32 per best case scenario. Uh, like you, like we said here, I mean, in terms of the youth, uh, in terms of developing youth, I don't really get the B team lately. Like I said, Andreas Doli is the best thing that's come out of the B team, and that speaks absolute volumes. Uh, another thing I would like to ask, though, is, do we believe that the idea of bringing in uh, Pedro Alves, that's his name, that's the new sporting director who's going to take over at Olympiacos from Estoril, do we really believe that that's something that was decided in the last few weeks? Or maybe, or was that maybe something that could have even been decided when Cordon and Marinakis shook hands? That's another question, again, the lack of clarity. That's another thing for me. The lack of clarity. I just... Cordon comes in as the man who's going to change everything at Olympiacos and is going to bring Olympiacos back to where they're supposed to be and maybe even take them to even greater heights. And then less than six months later, hey guys, yeah, and he's not exactly with Olympiacos. He's kind of with Olympiacos, but he's also going to be doing the other teams and maybe he's going to be more interested in the other teams, especially in Nottingham Forest, which is very interesting to see what's going to happen with Ross Wilson as well in the next few days slash weeks. What do you think, Adi? Do you think that the whole, you know, the, the, this big restructure was in the works was something that uh, was was conceived a few weeks ago or maybe a few months ago i think the the question that answers all of that is when was the decision made to purchase rio ave when was that being considered because if that was being considered over the summer then i would think that this was a conversation that was had, if that was the case. If Rio Ave was something that came about in the last month or so, then no. But if if I 100% would believe if the Rio Ave purchase was under consideration over the summer, 
there's no way that wasn't discussed with Gordon then. Because then it's, hey, I'm purchasing a third club. I need you to do that. But anyway, it's... I don't think that's something we'll ever know. And the, the unfortunate thing is I wish I, the communication from the club was better. Better is a bad word. More direct, more clear, more transparent in that regard. Because I don't think there would be this many issues if you were if they if they if they just told you how it was going to be. Like if there's an idea there, hey, this is how there's just going to be this network. Boom. I feel like people would be a lot less upset if they knew where things stood. Sure, people are going to be upset one way or another, but when there's a lack of real clarity behind that's it, a, that's the thing. Lack that's of the problem, that's the thing. and that's why people that's always get upset. But anyway, it's uh, I, I don't know. And then it's like the, on top of that, right? On, and, on top of this whole thing. It's not just like this business that's going on. It's also the the football, right? Because if we were playing high flying football, I don't think people would be as upset with what's going on. But there's a lot of people are unhappy with West Ham, right? Even though for me it was always going to be a difficult task anyway. Uh, we had the 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 match the match against Asteras. And then uh, two nothing, and then Panatolikos. And mm. in both of those games, we did not look great. Uh, especially Panatolikos. I mean, outplayed by Panatolikos for especially in the beginning, and in in these games. Yeah, but that we're was getting... a, that was a rotated side, to be fair. And I'm pretty well, sure it, it was. The was it was a rotated side against Asteras. It was. Well, it was sure. a rotated side against yeah. Asteras. And you know, to be fair, against Panatolikos, we had some some rotations. But the theme of both of those games is we're playing against mid to bottom tier Super League teams. We are struggling, and Costas Fortunis has to bail us out. Five goals. Okay, Costa, in the last two games, the last two official Super League games, Costas Fortunis has been involved in all five of them. I feel the like the big, the big, no, no, go ahead. The, the, well, that's that's just the point. And I, I, love, I, I love that he's doing so well this season. But my point is it's when we lose that production from him, from one that individual that's doing so much, what, where is it going to come from? We haven't found anybody else that can produce for us. I would like to say, though, uh, it's very important because I feel like maybe we're getting a little negative here, a little too negative. Maybe, keyword. But the thing is that Pedro Alves, we said it before we went on air, Ari, and I think we need to, I think we need to make people understand Pedro Alves is a very good sporting director. He was very successful right, at right. Estoril. He is, no, he is no donkey. And, uh, well, I'll tell you this. It's not, we're not getting Vredzos, we're not getting Miltiadis Marinakis, we're not getting Jose Anigo as the new sporting director. It's, it's Pedro Alves. He is, a, he is good at his job. He is proven. He's young. He's hungry. It is a good addition. But I'll, again, maybe I'm getting negative again. But because of what happened with Cordon, now I'm thinking to myself, let's say Alves comes in and he brings in a top center back. He brings in a top striker, a very good midfielder. Olympiacos win the title. And in the summer, he brings in even better players, better deals coming in. Money ball football, selling Camara, selling Rezzos, all that money flowing in. Olympiacos in the Champions League. Olympiacos win the double. Olympiacos do great in Europe, kind of like 2019-2020. Is he going to stay at Olympiacos? Is there like a, a, a is there like a long term project with Alves, or will he we see him going to Forest, or maybe Rio Ave, or maybe Monza if Monza are, are bought? That's what I'm thinking. Like, okay, it's great that Alves is here, but is that a long term prospect, or will it, or, or will in the next six months will we hear him going to Nottingham Forest to replace Ross Wilson? That's how I'm thinking right now. Well, Costa, we. Um... Let, let's look at some of the comments and see what some of the audience have to say. I, I do want your, your, your opinion, though. Um, well, th I think this is a, a, a really good comment, actually, by James, by James Hallett. Uh, Marinakis, first and foremost, is a businessman. And the whole cooperation with Mendez only shows that he sees our team 
from that perspective. All in all, seems like a plan fully organized by Mendez and not Mighty Nikes. Now, we do know uh, Pedro Alves is a Mendez guy. He was offered yeah. to Olympiacos, proposed by Mendez. So, and we've done a lot of business with Mendez uh, in the oh. last uh, few years. So, I wouldn't be surprised if he's involved in a way um, as he always seems to be. So, but it's. Uh, we, we there's just there's so much we have to see first, but I, I it doesn't surprise me that Mendez is involved and and making moves on our behalf. Um, we we were we're already in bed with him as we've seen with many of the deals that have been done. So it's. Um, but is Alves a long term pro project in your opinion? Do you think that he's the kind of guy who can stay for three years at Olympiacos? You know That's what I mean. <laughs> It, it's not Alves I have the – like, it's not the person I have the concern with. It's the context surrounding it that I, I'm, mm. I'm worried about because his CV is – like, it's so weird. I, I can't remember the last time we had somebody that had such a good resume, such a good CV, right, coming into well, this. Well, Cordon. Well, Cordon. Well, that, besides Cordon, right? Could be besides but, Cordon, you know, yeah. But, like, Cordon, it was really bad situation, great resume. We're like, okay, great, let him cook. But now this guy's got a great resume as a sporting director coming in and we're like, oh, be because of what's going on around him, I, I, I like I like face value. I think he could be that like be here, the sporting director that's here for a few years. Easy. It's just that we've opened up a can of worms that has so many different possibilities depending on where Olympiacos exists in the hierarchy. And that concerns me. So I don't know. It's. Uh, I think he could be face value, yes, but the the consideration for whether or not he will be is. I don't think it has much to do with him in general. It's it's more about the environment surrounding him. Um, but uh, okay. But if we want to be, if we want to live in the moment, then so we don't. We, I don't want our fans to get uh, to get depressed. Uh, and I do want them to like and subscribe and join us on Patreon as well. You know. Uh, <laughs> He is a great, if you want to live in the yeah, moment, he, let's live in the moment right now. He is a great sporting director, guys. Great sporting director. He's a great sporting director. Like, if, if he gets hired this summer instead of Cordon, I, we're, we're happy. Like, he, he's done, he, he is a sporting director, another one, that has done, made a mountain out of nothing. Literally, mm -hmm. zero budgets, sold players for a lot. Like, another guy that is exactly the type of uh, character we're looking for. Anyway, but that's... Um, I mean, uh, he, Ilios, right here. Ilios is, is saying exactly what I'm saying as well. If he had yeah. come in the summer, we would be happy, no doubt. Him coming to replace Cordon within a few months is what's bugging me. Yeah, that's what and, we're saying and, basically here. And that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point, you know, the that that we're making here. It's the context around him. Um, a couple more comments here. Uh, I wanted to touch. Yeah, let's on. go through them because uh, we've had we've had quite the quite the interaction, quite the, quite yes. the conversation here going on. Um, so, uh, Arispan, does it matter who's on top? Leipzig is top for RB, but Salzburg is the one selling, burning the titles. And I well, think I mentioned earlier that like, for me, at least, as long as I know where we stand, as long as I know what the strategy is and I, we see that flow benefit us, we're going to win titles. And in the end, if we're winning titles, that's, that's what matters. We're winning titles, getting into the champions league. It's a benefit that then I don't care who's who's supposed to be at the top rung. The 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 problem becomes though, if Forrest is top dog, this comment right here from uh roll face on keyboard. Uh I imagine Forrest and you know would be the number one dog until they go down, in which everything turns to chaos. I don't think it does. It does still they're gonna be top because they're gonna be in the championship, they're gonna have that windfall mind, the windfall cash from the Premier League. They're going to buy a parachute, few players. Parachute, payments, parachute yeah. well, windfall parachute uh, to Mera Tamara, and uh, you and and they can uh, they can come back the next the next season. Do a do a Leicester, do a Norwich. Norwich hold the record. I, right. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> Lagis Gavalas never never ceases to uh, to entertain. To me, it looks like a network that moves players around for the sake of moving them, aka money laundering no 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 um, sorry guys that i disagree on this one i disagree because there are uh, there are outlets there are procedures in this there are there, there are Olympia, is bringing the right people 
to manage this. Cordon is the right person to be a group manager in this. Bru uh, see, I almost did it. Pedro Alves is the right guy for Olympiacos. See, I almost called him Bruno Alves. There you go. Uh, no, I don't agree. I'm sorry, I don't agree. Uh, yeah, he is in Estoril, but uh, yeah, that's not Rio Ave, though. Uh, Andres Mitzi is for sure a little too early to draw conclusions from the Alves Cordon news, but you can certainly speculate. And that's, the, like, like I said, we have to wait till the end of the summer, really, to see how interactions will be. Uh, it won't be the clearest indicator because it'll just be the first summer, but we will begin to see kind of how things will operate. And, and we'll see. River RR, put yourself in the shoes of the players leaving the Premier League and having to play in the Greek League. Maybe those who come from Portugal will have more motivation. Um, that's not always a guarantee. Look at Pepe. True, but like Rio Ave are, are, are struggling for uh, to avoid relegation yeah. in the Primera Liga. But then if they, if they come to Olympiacos where they can win trophies, well, okay, forget the trophies. They can play in the Europa League and uh, maybe even play in the, play, in the knockouts of the Europa League. Well, that, that alone is a motivation because Rio Ave just don't want to get relegated this season. Whereas Olympiacos, they keep on dreaming in Europe. Europe is always uh, a goal for Olympiacos. Yeah. Adi Spahn has an interesting comment here. Also in the Bloom group, Union SG will probably be the more successful club despite Brighton being the obvious focus. Question shouldn't be what the main club is, but how serious Marinakis is about it. Of course, so that of course. speaks to what you said. If Forrest get relegated, it may not actually matter. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's the whole purpose of having that. Red Bull calls it the global board. If something happens, you know, your number one source for the feed gets relegated the strategy has to shift in in that respect where the players are going to go so and i feel um, like my next is going to be serious about it uh, and I, like we said my next is ambitious he wants to succeed he wants everything to succeed this is not a mari nike's in, in in my opinion at least this is not a mari nike's hazing right here this is just this is just i personally i'm expressing some disappointment regarding the lack of clarity that's what i'm doing right here personally yeah there, there's a comment here from Stefanos Panutsopoulos. Guys, you should talk about the positives of a multi-club group. There are many advantages. We should be patient. It is only November in the season. I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure I also just said we have to wait till the end of the summer to really evaluate where the thread is going, which direction it goes. Um, there, there, look, I think we also even discussed what the positives are, but again, Stefano, the, the problem it's, it's not the multi-club group situation. Isn't itself the problem, right? Neither real Ave is not the problem. Nottingham forest. Isn't the problem. Olympiacos isn't the problem. The problem is the history of behavior that we have seen. So. A lot of people are off put by the relationship between Nottingham Forest and Libyakos. It has shifted. We are now the ones getting some of the trash from Nottingham Forest. It's not working out for us the same way it didn't work for them. Uh, uh, there are a lot of fans who I disagree with. I think he doesn't care about Libyakos anymore, uh, especially with the purchase of another club. They think it's just another reason that he doesn't care about the club. I don't agree with that. If the development model is done in the manner with great talent identification, the way it's done in Red Bull, then it, it it there are a lot of positives. It's not the question of whether the model itself is good or bad. The question is, do we, does our ownership, everybody involved, have what it takes to do what needs to be done? Do you think this club, Olympiacos, with its culture, can fit in this type of model? That is the question. Uh, Antonio Cordon wasn't just brought in here to just bring us great players. He was here to build something. There was a comment from one of our patrons that uh, – patrons, sorry. From one of our audience that brought this up. I don't remember who. It might have been Adis Pan. So he's here to build something. And if he's at – if he's going to be the one on the global board – making the strategy when it comes to transfers and, and the football outlook, then, then, then you know he's trying to build something. There are plenty of positives to it. The worry, which is the cause of the negative sentiment, isn't the, the just 
that it's a multi-club thing. No, that's not the problem. The problem is that based on the pattern of what we see and based on the culture at Libyakos, we don't know how we're going to fit into that. Is Libyakos going to just turn into a, a, a talent development organization overnight? No, it's not. It doesn't matter what the... It doesn't matter what the model calls for. Will our fans let that happen if it means we're losing titles? There you go. The culture. You said it really well. And it, honestly, in my opinion, the vast majority of Olympiacos fans, the vast majority of Olympiacos fans, they don't give a you know what about Nottingham Forest. They don't give a you know what about Rio Ave. They don't know you. They don't give. They, they don't give. A, they don't give a damn about the, uh, about Rio Ave. If I Monza, Nottingham Forest, Rio Ave, they don't care. So that's it. Like, do Olympiacos have the culture to be a part of a group, and you know, and, and sometimes you know, do do the do, do the tough task of you know, uh, losing something for the sake of the group? Or is, is that the kind of thing Olympiacos can become? I don't think so. No, I mean, the I mean, I I do I believe that something can be built. In a few years, yes. Am I patient enough to wait for that? Of course I am. Even as frustrating as it'll be, as much as I'll have to hear Lambro rant about it all the time. But is Gate 7 going to be, official Gate 7 going to be that patient? Are the Greek fans in Greece going to be that patient? Is the media that surrounds Olivia Kos like a hawk going to be patient? No. No, they're not. No. And and th- I, I guess... Maybe Costa, that's probably a better way of, of um, painting the picture, illustrating what the worry is. And it's, again, not so much that the model has a problem or we see a problem with, with that. It's that I don't believe we have the, condult, the culture that's conducive to even accepting this. Can you see anybody accepting that we are, you know, if, if the club were to come out and say, look, Top is Forest. We're here. Rio Ave is underneath. There's going to be a feeder loop like this. Do you think anybody in Greece is going to accept any of the major, major, you know, whether it's reporters, whether it's Gate 7, do you think they're going to accept that from Olympiacos? That we're not the most important thing? Being, I, was, I, I grew up with Olympiacos being, being, you know, Olympiacos above all. That's how I grew up as a fan here in Greece. And what I've been seeing, like, no, like you said, I don't think the culture of Olympiacos is the kind of thing where, you know, at least sometimes Olympiacos will have to pull the, the short straw. Nah. Yeah. I, I just, that's my, that's my worry. It's the stuff around it that I, that I think, I don't know. I just don't think, I, I'm, look, I, I am always ready to be surprised and proven wrong. And if that were to happen yeah, four years from now, I would be the happiest person ever because it would mean we're finally modernizing. Uh, we we've just seen a lot that tells me it it probably wouldn't happen. There's, you know the 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 culture in Greece is, and that doesn't just go for Libyakos. That's for any club, any one of the Greek top club. clubs, any yeah. Greek club. It's just too toxic for that to happen. Uh, but as we said, you know, as we said, we hope we are wrong, and we hope we're going to be surprised. We'd love to be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Well, Costa, we're coming up almost to an hour here. Um, you know, let's uh i think maybe we should end on something that's more potentially more encouraging or a positive note something to look forward to oh <laughs> and, and which could easily turn downward the other way uh maybe some some football talk in this on this show we've got freiburg coming up on thursday we had the three to one win against panatolikos yesterday uh we talked about it briefly in context of the whole sporting director issue that it is yet another game where the the depth of Olympiacos is just not producing. It doesn't look very good. And against Panatolikos, I mean, we were at home, and that was an empty stadium. So no, no, no. That's, okay, yeah, of course. Sorry, but sorry, it, wasn't, it wasn't that um, – it just wasn't that good in the beginning, and we relied on an individual to carry us out again. Uh, Christos is going to be there. Fantastic, buddy. Send us pictures. Take nice pics. Take nice pics and nice videos, Christos. So it's – I'm a little concerned because in the first leg, I thought we were better than Freiburg, 
We were also and better lost- in the second leg last season when the when the team was crap. Right. And but as we're seeing things happen, if we play against them like we did against Panatolikos or Asteras. See, look, Paco's getting involved here too. He he wants to share with you his his opinions. But he, he wants he, he knows a, th- a few things about Alves. He's got an exclusive about uh, Pedro Alves. There you go. But <laughs> How do, how do you see the match? I mean, if we play like we did the last two Super League games, there's no way we come away with a result. Impossible. Well, like you said, you hit the nail right in the head. And I've been meaning to say this in the in the podcast for quite a while. Olympiacos, on paper, have a lot of uh, a lot of depth. Uh, before I get to this, uh, we have uh, Irakor, who, who has kindly donated... Uh, five euros to us. Ira, thank you so much for your donation. Υπέκτες του ΠΑΟ ήταν φανερά επηρεασμένοι από τον θάνατο της κυρία. Δεν σημαίνει αυτό χάσανε σήμερα. Εντάξει, οκ, well, thank you for the, uh, thank you for the comment, thank you for the donation, uh, Ira. Παναθηναϊκός did lose uh, 2-0 <laughs> to Aris. My God, we need to stop doing late shows, Ari. Please, we need to stop doing late shows. <laughs> bring, bring the kids over to Greece, man. They're going to love it. <laughs> or you know, let me stay. G- give me a room in Ma- in Maryland, man. I-, I think we can work something out. <laughs> really good rent. <laughs> okay, so, uh, damn it. Uh, uh, w- when it comes to the Freiburg game, I, I have to say I have been dr- I have been living for this match until last night when I heard what happened today with Cordon being uh, being moved. And I have to say I've. I've I've watched a lot of dreams about that match. I cannot stop dreaming about that match. And in every dream, Olympiacos win. They beat Freiburg in every dream I watch. Except the one two nights ago where I saw Olympiacos losing 9-5. And I was thinking to myself, if, if the defense wasn't that crap, we would have beaten them 5-0. It is, it's is—it's a final, isn't it? It's a final right there for, uh, yep. for Olympiacos. Because if Olympiacos don't win, that's it. That's it. Europa League is over. I mean, arithmetically, right. mathematically, it's over. Uh, and if Olympiacos beat Freiburg, then they need West Ham to beat uh, to beat um, to beat Freiburg in London. But that is if Olympiacos beat Batska in Greece. If right. they don't beat Batska, they don't deserve to be in Europe. Period. Uh, but if Olympiacos beat beat Freiburg with a two goal difference, then even a draw works at Olympiacos' favor. In right. London, and remember, uh, West Ham are going to be serious about it because they could lose first place, and they can't afford losing first place because they're going to play a playoff in the Europa League while they're still in the they're still gunning for a top spot in the Premier League, and they're playing the FA Cup, and they're playing in the uh, League Cup as well. What I was trying to say before that that donation is that on paper, Olympiacos have immense depth on paper, yeah. but in reality, the only position Olympiacos have depth in is the goalkeeper's position. Pasalakis is out, in comes Zolakis. In every other position, there is no depth. There's basically right. no depth. There's nothing. And uh, Costas Fortuna is bailing the team too much, like you said. Uh, we saw that again against Panetolikos. But some good news. Ayub El Kabi finally broke his near two-month goalless drought, which is yeah. huge for a center forward like El Kabi. A, ta- a talismanic center forward like him just before that Freiburg game and that's that's where I'm, that's where I come to my conclusion Costas Fortuny is not going to win the game is not not going to win the game for us against Freiburg guys Costas Fortuny cannot do it alone he's not going to do it alone he's not going to take the ball and push Olympiacos forward we need to see we need to see uh, performances from the big personnels. We need to see Podence, who played against Panatolikos, he can play against Freiburg. We need to see El Kabi, who scored against Panatolikos. We need to see Masuras, who does create and score goals. He does participate in goals. In goals. Uh, Ari, you made, a, you, made a, you made a stat graph about him. We need Mati Camara to show up in this game. We need, to send, we need the midfield with Santiago Eze. We need uh, Rodin, Rodine and uh, Ortega to help the wingers up front. We need the defense as well. There's the big, the, the big, the big, the big question right there. Panos Retos is going to play. Who's going to be his partner? Jackson Poroso injured, probably until the Panathinaikos game in Low Forest. There's a good chance he's not going to be fit for that game either. He's going to miss Volos as well. He's going to miss Batska. Probably going to miss Panathinaikos as well. Freire is out, so it's either Doi or Ibora, who's who played as a centre back for 15 minutes with Retos. We're going to need performances, guys. Fortunis is not going to win it for Olympiacos. And 
I'm in agreement with you there because first of all, you know Freiburg, the center, one of the centers of their of their game plan is going to be making sure he's limited because it's no secret that he is right now the the best player on the team. Most goal contributions doesn't matter, like overall per ninety, whatever. It's just, he's the best in every facet. So uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, it was really important that El Kabi broke his almost two month duck. Helios, you're not allowed to, to tweet how good he is anymore. No more jinxes from you, my friend. And then Masuras. Masuras, he got two assists yesterday. He hasn't contributed to, to anything on goal in like three weeks. So also huge. So let's hope that that's the uh, – um, let's, let's, let's really, really hope that we are going to get something out of this because I or, – or sorry, let's hope that these – the players that are, are scoring El Kabi Masuras, that this this is really something that is going to help and they're going to have better performances because I don't want to see another case of our starting 11s out. We're playing pretty decent. And then the second we start making subs, it all goes to shit again. That should not be happening. So uh, for me, the, the key is going to be because I don't trust our depth right now. I don't. The key is going to be when our best 11 is out there, we've got to score. We've got to score when they're on there. And then just pray that we can keep a lead after, you know, if we can get the lead at the 60 before the 65th minute mark, we just have to then pray that we can hold it after that. Like that's, that's how I'm thinking about this. Cause I just don't see, I don't have any trust in our depth currently. That's going to be the big thing for, for the winter is getting in depth at the positions we talked about uh, on social media, getting depth at center back, getting depth in the midfield, getting depth uh, for the center forward position. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to have to do. I don't, I'm not, I'm not confident that we're going to do anything after the 65th minute. If we're going to do it, the starters are going to have to come out strong. That includes guys like Fortuny, hopefully somebody. And that's, and then we just defend for the, for, for the win, if that's the case. But, if we don't get a goal before like 65 minutes, I don't see us scoring. I, I feel like if Olympiacos play with Podens, Fortunis, and El Cabi up front in that 4 3 3 formation we loved against West Ham in Greece, if a goal is not scored by halftime, then you got to bring Masuras on for, uh, uh, for the second half. Like uh, that needs to be your halftime substitution. Masuras definitely needs to come in. When it comes to Jovetic, we haven't seen that spark, but the guy really brings it for Montenegro. Two assists, one goal in the, in two matches during the uh, international break. He's no slouch, but Martinez needs to find a way to bring him in and play the kind of game that suits him. I could say the same about Scarpa, Bielo, Solbaik, and very talented players, and they are very talented players. But Olympiacos needs, a go needs goals against Freiburg. I don't, you know what? Screw it. Forget the, the two-goal difference. Forget the two-goal deficit. Just win. Just go out there and win. Yep. Just do it. That's it. Uh, Gostar, we're over an hour in. So it's getting to be about that time. Uh, really quickly, before we get start getting ready to sign off here, guys, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to like and subscribe. There's also a poll up. Um, uh, the, in the poll, that we had asked uh, if the situation involving Gordon or uh, and Pedro Alves uh, replacing him at Libiacos was bad for Libiacos. This whole situation regarding the uh, potential model that we could be emulating, like Red Bull, and uh, the votes are in. Uh, Forty-three percent of you said it's too early to tell, so we can't really have an opinion. We have to wait. Twenty-six percent said yes. Twenty-six percent said no. So 26% said yes, the situation is good for Libyakos. 26% said no, and 6% said neither good nor bad. So the majority seem to agree that it's too early to tell. We have to wait and see what happens. But uh, uh, there are plenty that still believe that it is either good or not good. So anyway, a lot of great stuff coming up, guys. Really Really excited for Thursday, uh, and we have to say, given the situation going on, it, it's definitely a situation that will really cause a ruckus in Greece. We're, you know, we win, it'll be all positivity. All of this will be in the back view, but if we lose, the magnifying glass will be on everything. Media will be coming out, hunting for Martinez, hunting for Cordon, 
I can feel it. I can just feel it now. I, I feel like we, Nam Cordon, Cordon has never been safer than he than he is right now. Well, that's true. I mean, if actually, want, yeah. If, if they want to make him a global president, global sporting <laughs> yeah. director, well, he's 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 safer than ever, isn't he? Yeah, it'll be Martinez is the one that now probably has a little bit less protection, but uh, in that regard, but no, absolutely, we'll yeah. If, uh, if Olbecos don't win, then yeah, there's going to be there's going to be some some complaining. So, anyway, it was a great conversation. A lot of crazy things happening, guys. Uh, follow the space. A lot of fun stuff happening. Uh, we'll try and get a live going on Thursday. Uh, a lot of data will come out pre match as always. Uh, post match as always. So check that out. Uh, I will be doing an enhanced analysis for the Freiburg game, regardless of what happens. Uh, you can join us on Patreon if you want access to that. We have an interview that will be recorded on Monday for Patreon with a Ram Nikki player. Um, and uh, he's going to be sharing some of his experiences, which are pretty wild uh, in Greece playing a Ram Nikki. So uh, that that's fun. And if you want to support us and check those out, we do fun things like that on Patreon all the time. So you can visit patreon.com slash gate seven international and Costa, do you have anything else before we close up? Yeah. One final thought. I just got a, I just got a text from a good buddy of mine. Uh, if Labros is watching us, uh, Pedro Alves is looking for him because he wants a, he wants a full scouting report about Ramon. Well, let's help out you guys. I mean, come on. Pamethrile, Pamethrile, gotta help. Do it for the team. Now that's that is something not what I was expecting. Do it for the team. Do it for the team. <laughs> All right, guys. This is Gate 7 International by the fans for the fans. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Ya